Good morning, everyone. And good morning to everybody watching from home as well. Boys and girls, it's great to see you here as well. I don't know about you, but a couple of weeks ago, when it looked like the summer was maybe on its way, we did probably what lots of you did. We, we got out our garden furniture, we dusted it down, we got the barbecue out of hibernation, we tended to the grass and all the rest, thinking that the month of May would be all outdoor living. Well, it hasn't turned out like that, has it? This week we've had hail, we've had very strong winds, we've had lots of rain, and we even had a flurry of snow. Life really is unpredictable. In Northern Ireland, it seems you never know what a new day will bring. Well, this week, or this morning, we gather together for worship, confident that one thing never changes, God's love for us and his faithfulness to us. Last week in his call to worship, Philip reminded us of that with Psalm 100. Do you remember how that Psalm ends? With that common refrain we hear in so many of the Psalms. For the Lord is good, his love endures forever. I want us to return to that refrain this morning for our call to worship with the words of another Psalm. We're going to have a call and response with some words adapted from Psalm 118. Will you please join with me in the words in yellow on the screen? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. In our anguish, we cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting us free. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Our opening song draws us back to that refrain as well, as we give thanks to our God. Forever God is faithful. Faithful, let's stand and sing together.
let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray together. When we gather to praise you, Lord, we remember that we are a people who have often prepared to do our own will rather than yours. And so we pray, holy and merciful God, we give you thanks today because as we have heard of what we have heard and what we have sung together, that you are good and your love endures forever. Lord, it is your goodness and your love that allows us to come before you now. As we confess our sinfulness and our shortcomings and our offenses against you, like your people who grumbled in the wilderness, who doubted your promises, who lacked the courage to go where you lead. We too have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins. Help us to live in your light and to walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God, the creator, brings us new life. He forgives us and restores us. So let us hold on to this forgiveness today as we seek to serve Christ in our world. We continue our series in the book of Numbers today. And Jim, who will be speaking to us shortly, has been given a, a challenging task of looking at all of Numbers 13 and 14. Well, we're just going to read a short selection of those verses now together. Our first section is from Numbers 13, verses 1 to 2, and then 26 to 33. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Our second section is from Numbers 14, verses 1 to 5, 10 to 11, and then 17 to 24. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? 
how long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? Moses said, now may the Lord's strength be displayed just have you, as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Thanks be to God for this reading from his word. Good morning, everyone. Where is the cloud? Now, in case you didn't hear me clearly, I didn't say, where is the crowd? Crowds aren't allowed in church with COVID. I said, where is the cloud? Now, that may seem a, a strange question to you, but that's the question that struck me when I came in the book of Numbers to the story we've just read about the Israelites camped on the border of the Promised Land. Where's the cloud? A cloud in the Bible, by the way, always indicates the presence of God. You'll remember that the Exodus was controlled by a, a mysterious cloud. Even when the Israelites fled from Egypt, God sent them a cloud to come between them and the Egyptians to protect them. And as they traveled on, the, the, the cloud went before them to guide them. At night, we're told it shone like a, a pillar of fire. And to those of you who have been reading through the book of Numbers, you'll know in chapter 9, uh, the story of the building of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, which was constructed when they were stopped at Sinai for a while. It's a cloud that determines when they will go and where they will go. We read in Numbers 9, 21, whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. When the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would go. A cloud in the Bible always indicates the presence of God. And guided by that cloud, the folks who were with Moses, arrived at last at this huge oasis of Kadesh Barnea on the southern tip of Canaan. They'd been led by a cloud to the very entrance to the promised land. What are they going to do? Is Moses going to march them straight in? Or are they going to have another big confab as they had had at Mount Sinai? By the way, you'll notice if you read in chapter 13, the cloud has disappeared. It's no longer mentioned. If it had been there, they would have known what to do. They would have been guided by the cloud. And why is it not there? Has something gone wrong? No. God had sent the cloud to guide them to the promised land, and they'd arrived. God had kept his promise, and it's as if he were saying to Moses now, over to you. Enter your inheritance. In fact, Moses recognizes this. We, we read in 13.1, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. And of course, he takes responsibility. He chooses a representative from each of the 12 tribes. He tells them to travel the length and breadth of the land, find out if it's inhabited, Find out what the cities are like. Are they walled or not? What's the soil like? Is it wooded? The promise of a land of their own, a land flowing with milk and honey, had sustained these people, had sustained them in all the problems and deprivations and dangers that they'd faced in their pilgrimage through the vastness of the Sinai Peninsula. Now they've arrived. Can you imagine the sense of relief, joy, expectation? 
You can almost see them dancing in the, around the campfire at night and singing in joy. How they must have envied those first 12, these men who were going to see what this great promised land was like. And you can imagine, too, the tension The tension they must have felt as they waited and waited and waited for them to return. I'm sure that all their luggage organized and everything packed so that they were ready to to cross the border and occupy the land. At last, the twelve did return. Everyone was on tiptoe with excitement. They were quite encouraged initially when the spies began to speak. We read in verse 27, The spy is saying, we went into that land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. It does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. They probably held up that massive bunch of grapes we read about that they'd struggled to carry home. And you could almost hear the cheers and see the people smiling and hugging one another. But then, unexpectedly, there comes a but. But the people who live there are powerful. We even saw giants, and the cities are fortified and very large. Suddenly, there's a chill in the air. It turns out that 10 of the 12 spies actually don't want to invade. We're not strong enough to attack them, they said. As we know, one other spy, Caleb, spoke up. We should attack, and we should take the land. We are strong enough to conquer it. Now, you can imagine the confusion amongst the ordinary people. Caleb and his friend Joshua must have been quite persuasive, speaking against the majority, because before long, the other ten resort to a tactic we all know well, Fake news. Fake news didn't start with Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. Here we are 3,500 years ago, and to get their way, the 10 spies change their story. They start to spread a bad report about the land, contradicting what they'd already said. They say, this land doesn't produce even enough food to feed its own people. That's the meaning of uh, verse 32, the land devours those who live in it, in the NIV. And then again, of course, they stress the size of the people. Everybody was massive. We felt as small as grasshoppers, they said. And then they make their appeal. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Now, remember at this stage, they're just two or three years away from Egypt. Let's turn back when we ca- while we can. Things weren't really that bad in the old days, were they? Why risk being slaughtered by the people of Canaan? Now, you can imagine the deflation and the disillusionment and the despair of the people. Their hopes, the dreams they had. Suddenly, this icy blast of reality sets them shivering in fear. And we read in 14 verse 1, That night, all the people raised their voices and wept aloud, and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. What went wrong? Why this sudden somersault into despair? As I see it, these people lost their focus. They forgot God, the God who had promised to give them this place of their own this land flowing with milk and honey. They'd forgot all about the God who'd guided them, provided for them, protected them as they'd traveled in the wilderness. The God who'd renewed his promise time and time again. Fear seems to have made them forget all that. Now, I've no doubt those spies, all 12 of them, set out with confidence. But when they saw the place, when they realized that they had to do something themselves, that they had to take risks, that they had to make sacrifices, that they had to face danger, maybe even face death, suddenly they take cold feet. They lost their focus on God. You know, immediately, 
when I was reading this story, I thought of that New Testament story of Peter being asked by Jesus to come walking to him on the water. Remember the story? Peter, of course, starts off confidently, but when he looks down and sees the waves and sees the storm, he becomes afraid. He begins to sink. He lost his focus. He lost his faith, trust in Jesus. So what we see here is exactly the same. And of course, we see it in our modern world as well. Exactly the same happens time and time again. Just to give you an example, a group of folk begin to talk about something needing to be done, maybe in their church or in their neighborhood. We ought to be doing something about older teenagers or for people living alone. Those folk talk. They take soundings of others. Enthusiasm go grows. Uh, God seems to be guiding them. They're following a cloud. Plans are made. All the details worked out. And then on the border of their promised land, they begin to hear the demands. Time will be needed. Money will have to be committed. There's going to be a personal cost. What if our plans are misunderstood? What about the type of people who, who will maybe attract? There may be problems about that. And then somebody says, well, maybe we should just stick with what we have. Let's drop our plans for the present. Let's go back to Egypt. Now you find this happening in all types of organizations and in individual families and in individual circumstances. And often the bigger the project, the greater the fear. Once you lose focus, once you lose confidence, once you give in to fear, God can disappear from your picture. Now it's important to count the cost, but there comes a time in every project, big and small, individual and corporate, when the cloud withdraws and God says, it's over to you. Enter your promised land. Take the step of faith. Some of you here today may be uh, pondering some action in your own life. Maybe you're becoming hesitant after thinking about it for a long time. If God has guided you to take some step, don't look at the giants. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And off you go. But back to the border of Canaan. It's interesting what happens next. Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies, keep on arguing. The land is good. It's flowing with milk and honey. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will give us the land. People don't listen. Everybody is so angry that they start talking about stoning them to death. It's only the return of the cloud over the tabernacle that brings the people to their senses, the presence of God again. Moses speaks with God, we read. God is angered with their disobedience. God says he is going to disown them and punish them. Moses pleads with God, be merciful with these faithless people. Forgive them, Lord. And God does forgive. But he announces that none of them over 20 years of age will ever enter the promised land. Only the faithful Caleb and Joshua and their families will go there. God had brought them to the land of promise and they'd refused to enter. So they will not enter. That was God's position. And I think there's an important principle here. Divine mercy does not exclude divine judgment. What I mean is this. We may have been forgiven, but there can be continuing consequences of our sin, and God may not remove them. Let me give you an example. Did you see the photographs on television, what was it, about three weeks or more ago, of the young man throwing the petrol bomb on Donegal Road at the police. That young man, of course, we know, burnt himself badly. We saw it all on the screen. Now, if you imagine that young man lying in great pain in a hospital ward, maybe realizing his wrongdoing and asking God to forgive him, 
God says if we forget, confess our sins, he will forgive. He may be forgiven, but if you were to look at his hands today, his fingers may be almost fused together by the fire. Or you look at the burns around his neck and head. Or look at the mess he's made of his face. He may be forgiven, but the scars remain. And it's the same with us. Now, most of us, of course, aren't going to be throwing petrol bombs. We sin in more discreet and private ways. It may be some aspect of our behavior, a sharp tongue, a, a, a quick temper, a jealous nature, a, a dishonest lifestyle. Whatever it is, if we acknowledge our sin, God is willing to forgive. We know that from Scripture. But there are continuing consequences. The damage to our reputation may never be erased. We may have permanently affected our career chances or our family relationships. The scars remain. And they can affect not only us, but our children's children. That's really the meaning of the warning that you get in verse 18 about suffering unto the third and fourth generation. Now let me give you an example of what this means. Some years ago, I was working in America in Wilmington, Delaware, and I came across a, a young woman in her 20s who was deeply disturbed, depressed. She had no sense of self-worth at all, and yet she was actually highly intelligent, a graduate of a, a leading American university. Her father was a senior official in the Department of Agriculture in Washington. She came from a fine Christian family. She was the only child with every advantage in life. Why? Why had this beautiful young lady with every advantage become such a wreck? It turned out, I discovered, that her father was an enthusiastic senior leader in the Boy Scout movement in America. And this was in the days before there were girls in the Scouts. One day, he was visited by another uh, senior Scout leader. She was perhaps about 11 or 12 at the time. And she overheard her father say, we have just one child. But unfortunately, it's a girl. Unfortunately, it's a girl. Those words played on that girl's mind throughout her teenage years, and she knew she could never be what her father dearly wanted her to be. The last I heard of her, she had got married herself, but I often wonder about the mental health of her children. That father's sin harmed his relationship with his daughter, damaged his life and hers unwittingly. And I'm sure it has damaged members of that family onto the third and fourth generation. In those thoughtless words, he lobbed a petrol bomb of poison into that sensitive child's soul. And I wonder, has the fire gone out yet? I doubt it. Now, a large number of our ladies here, and I see some of them around the congregation, are studying the book of James at present. What does the book of James say about the tongue? James 3, 6, the tongue is a fire and is itself set on fire by hell. In other words, what James is saying, words have consequences, serious and long-lasting consequences to the third and fourth generation. Don't let your tongue be the source of sin in your life or destroy someone else's. We'll soon be coming to the Lord's table. What does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 11, a man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Otherwise, he may eat and drink judgment on himself. Before we partake today, we need to pause, confess our sins, our lack of trust, the harm we have done to others, lest we bring judgment on ourselves instead of blessing. Let's return for a final time to the camp.
at the borders of Canaan. Why did it happen? We come back to the mistake of those spies. As they traveled through that land that they'd been promised, a, a very prosperous land, a land flowing with milk and money, on honey, they saw the, the large fortified cities, they saw the giants, and they forgot the God who'd been guarding, guiding, providing for them through all the hazards of their escape from Egypt. They forgot the promises he'd made, they forgot the power of God, and in fear and insecurity they said, let us go back to Egypt. You see, once you lose your focus on God, you can lose your way in life. This city of Belfast is full of folk who've gone back to Egypt. We know many of them. We have them among our friends, people who in earlier years faithfully followed Jesus, but today, they'd lo today they're not there. They lost focus. They lost their way. They've gone back to Egypt. Now, God has given us the Lord's Supper, which we'll be celebrating today. It's Enable it, it's, it's, an, it's meant to help us keep our focus on what is at the core of our faith. Here we have something that vividly reminds us that there is a God, a God who loves us, and indeed it shows us the extent of that love. And as we think of Jesus' suffering and death for our salvation, we remember too his triumph over sin and death on that first Easter day. And so as we come today, confessing our sins and as we trust ourselves to him afresh today he gives us the power to face every temptation to defeat every giant that would seek to destroy us this sacrament reminds us of the presence of Jesus with us and the power of Jesus for us and we know that as we eat this bread and drink this wine that love and power and strength of Christ will enter in again to our lives and help us to sustain our lives as we follow him. So before we come to the feast, let's bow in reverence to pray. Let's all pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge that like the Israelites of old, too often we've rebelled against you and gone our own way. We've lost sight of your holiness. We have forgotten your commandments. We've become careless in our discipleship. Help us, Lord, to recognize the destructive consequences of our sins. Forgive us for our many sins. And help us, Lord, to follow more closely in your ways again. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we sing a hymn that, a plea to God that he might help us. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. Let us praise him.
at this point, we're going to bring our prayers for others before the Lord. And as many of you will know from listening to the news this past week, uh, the past couple of weeks, um, we're going to think in particular about the situation in India. And so our prayers will be focused this morning on that country and those organizations we support in this congregation, Open Doors and ASHA, as they seek to bring relief at this difficult time. Let's bow before God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, this morning we join with all those who are crying out on behalf of the people of India, where according to official figures, 2,700 people are dying each day as a result of COVID-19. In fact, some believe that number to be much, much higher. Lord, as we enjoy the easing of restrictions here in Northern Ireland, and as we reap the benefits of a fast vaccination rollout, we are all the more mindful of those who are suffering the worst of this pandemic. And so we bring to you these specific requests on behalf of your church in India, our sisters and brothers in Christ. Lord, we pray that medical supplies will be constantly available for COVID vaccines, vital medicines, and essential supplies of oxygen in the nation's hospitals. Father, we pray for your wisdom for political leaders as they seek to govern rightly, to make good decisions regarding the use of these resources to reduce pain and suffering and to counter the black market that has begun in that country to help those who have access to resources like money. And we think of our own leaders in the Western world. Father, embolden them to reach out a hand of friendship at this difficult time. Lord, we pray for families who are going through enormous pain of loss, neglect, loneliness and helplessness. And we think as Jim has preached to us of the consequences that will reverberate down the generations. The sheer numbers of deaths is overwhelming and many families are coping with the guilt and regret at not being able to mark the death of their loved one in an appropriate way. Father, we pray for your church in India. We pray in particular for those organizations supported by your people here in Kirkpatrick Memorial, for ASHA and for Open Doors. May there be a spirit of cooperation among your church and the different Christian groups across India. In this time of crisis, may they be united together in service of you as they seek to act justly in your name. Finally, Lord, we pray for the many Christian hospitals in that country who are serving a people in crisis. We ask in particular that you would strengthen and protect the doctors and medical staff so that they may be beacons of your hope amid chaos. Lord, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the light of the world and our eternal hope. Amen. Before we celebrate communion together, just a couple of announcements. And first, I want to say a word to the boys and girls. Um, thank you for being with us today and for sitting so patiently throughout the service. We haven't celebrated communion for quite a while in Kirkpatrick. And I imagine that when we did, you all weren't here for that part in the service. You were probably out at your, your different activities. So this is a wonderful opportunity this morning for you to look around and to pay attention to what the grown-ups are doing. You might have some questions about why we do this, why this supper, this Lord's Supper we're about to celebrate is so important to us as a church family. Well, I want you to ask your mom and dad those questions over the lunch table or over the dinner table tonight. Ask them why we do this, why it's important to them, and think about how one day you too will join us around this table. Apart from that, just two announcements to flag up to you. One is you'll have seen on the screen at the start, the big conversation 
It's your last opportunity to complete the survey online today. And if you're one of our members who has received that survey by post, don't worry if you haven't got it in the post yet. Um, put the stamp on it and pop it in the post box this week. It would be great to get as many responses as possible. And secondly, just to remember that we are praying throughout May. So if you receive the email, there are details there about how to do that online. And do remember, if you're not online, there's an opportunity to pray together between the two morning services. Thank you. We come now to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Before we begin, I want to say uh, that each of you should have one of these little cups with your individual bread and wine. This is a, a different way that we have to celebrate the sacrament at the moment. And when I come to the point in the service where I say, take, eat, this is the body of Christ broken for you, pull back the top piece of cellophane there, and there's a little piece of unleavened bread for you to eat. Then, uh, when I say the words uh, re regarding the cup, drink this cup, again, there's a piece of sellotape there, uh, cellophane, and you remove it, and we can uh, have both the elements. Uh, so that's uh, the mechanics of the service. But uh, let's begin. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we come to the table of Christ remembering his gracious words, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. This is the Lord's table. And I invite all of you, of whatever denomination or fellowship you belong to, I invite all of you to join with us in this sacrament in which we show our unity in Christ and our common devotion to him and to prepare ourselves to come to the table. We remain seated and we sing the hymn, We come as guests invited when Jesus bids us dine.
let's listen to the words of institution of the Lord's Supper as the Apostle Paul records them for us in 1 Corinthians 11. This is what he writes. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us follow the example of our Lord Jesus. We take the bread and wine, and I'd ask you to take it in your hand now. We take this bread and wine on which to feast and to remember him. And as Jesus began by giving thanks to the Father, let us bow before God. Let's pray. It is our duty and delight, Lord God, our Father, to give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for this world. Our hearts are full of gratitude to you because you love the world so much that you gave your only Son so that everyone who trusts in him may not die but have everlasting life. We thank you that Jesus was born among us, that he had lived our common life on earth, that he suffered and died for us, and that he rose again and is always present with us through the Holy Spirit. Remembering these things, we celebrate once again the supper of our Lord. We pray that despite our sins and doubts, the Holy Spirit may transform what we are doing so that as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we may share in the eternal life of Christ. And we thank you that we don't celebrate this supper alone, but in company with all your people, past, present, and to come. And with them and with all creation, we praise you and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. We praise you for the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of new life. We therefore set before you this bread and this wine as the thank offering of your people. And we thank you that in your fatherly mercy and by our Lord's provision and with the help of the Holy Spirit, these elements may be the means by which we remember Christ's sacrifice and share in his body and blood. And Jesus has given us the confidence and the longing to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance. May your kingdom come and your will be done in and through us all. Amen. Let us keep the feast. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the love that has brought us food from heaven and strengthens us for the journey of life. Grant that strengthened by this sacrament, 
we may in the power of the Holy Spirit continue to live in obedience to Jesus Christ until in the end we come into the glory of your eternal kingdom through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, let us bring the sacrament to a close as we stand and sing with joy. We, my heart is filled with thankfulness. Let us praise God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Kiran Martin. I am the founder and director of ASHA that is working among 700,000 slum dwellers uh, in the city of Delhi. Uh, I am here to tell you uh, what is going on with regards to the COVID crisis in India and in the city. Uh, many of you may have heard <coughs> that uh, India has uh, recorded over 350,000 uh, positive cases in the past 24 hours. Uh, Delhi itself has recorded about 25,000 cases within the same period. Uh, uh, there are no hospital beds uh, and there is no oxygen and therefore uh, patients are lying on the ground outside all the major hospitals desperately waiting for a bed and a lot of them are gasping for breath and uh, expiring simply because of the lack of oxygen. We have no idea when this crisis is going to uh, come to an end. As of now, uh, it is not possible for any patient requiring hospital admission to find a bed or even a place to lie on the ground in any of Delhi's hospitals. Uh, with regards to ASHA, uh, 
within the 700,000 population that we are covering, uh, we are determined to do the very best we can to look after every single patient that has been placed under our care all through the 91 slums. We are doing this with the help of our ASHA team that is made up of doctors, nurses, paramedics, health assistants, health workers and social workers. In addition, we are also using the services of our COVID warriors of which we have more than 300. These are young people from Delhi University that have been helped by ASHA. However, as you know, this particular strain is a double mutant strain and it is called B.1.617 and this double mutant strain is highly contagious and it is affecting young people. It is also affecting children. Therefore, it is all the more laudable that these warriors who are young are not shying away from going out into the communities and going at the front lines. The entire Asha team and warriors are going from home to home, lane to lane and street to street. This is so that we do not miss a single patient which has symptoms. I wish to tell you that the RT-PCR test is not available at this time in Delhi. Therefore, a diagnosis has to be made based on pulse oximeters and symptoms. Our warriors have been given lots of pulse oximeters as has our team and they are going from house to house. Anybody who has COVID like symptoms, anybody who has fever or upper respiratory symptoms is being treated as a COVID patient. We ha are uh, treating them with supportive treatment uh, when they are mild in nature, the symptoms and if the patient begins to deteriorate, then we have made all arrangements to give them nebulization with budesonide, uh, to give them steroids, to give them anticoagulants and also we are desperately trying to arrange for oxygen. We have been running from pillar to post but as of now we have not been successful, successful in acquiring either oxygen cylinders or oxygen concentrators. This is a very distressing situation. Uh, we are giving out masks in uh, uh, all our slum communities through mass distribution because it is been clearly mandated by the government and we are also of the view that everyone should wear a double mask. So the three ply surgical masks being provided by ASHA are being worn over the mask that the patient already has. There are a lot of patients around with dirty masks and we are encouraging them to discard those masks and wear clean three ply surgical masks. We also wish to distribute uh, large scale Dettol soap and we would like to buy more nebulizers, more pulse oximeters and we will be requiring uh, sanitizers also in bulk. All the PPE that is required by our team and warriors will be required in large, large amounts. In addition to all this, of course, we will be continuing to need the drugs that we need to provide these patients uh, depending on the severity of the symptoms. I know that you have stood with us all this time. You have in the first wave provided us with resources to do the best we could and because of that we were able to save many hundreds of lives. Right now we have many many patients in all our communities having fever and other symptoms which are very highly suggestive of COVID and we again once again appeal to you. I ask you to help us at this time uh, to uh, buy all that I have just mentioned. Uh, you can go to www.asha-india.org uh, and uh, on the home page there is a donate button. 
when you click the donate button, you will be able to make a donation for our COVID work uh, by being directed towards the country that you are from. For those who live in Delhi and those who would rather give in kind, I urge you to kindly consider giving us three ply surgical masks, N95 masks, Dettol soap, hand sanitizer, nebulizers, pulse oximeters, uh, budesonide respules, budesonide inhalers, uh, Visolone tablets, uh, Eliquis 5 milligram, and of course, oxygen cylinders uh, and oxygen concentrators, if at all you by some miracle find them somewhere. Our team member and driver will be more than happy to come and collect these items from your preferred location uh, since uh, it may not be considered appropriate by you to leave your home. We will be more than grateful for this type of in-kind assistance. Uh, please remember that we are looking at after 700,000 people in 91 slums. It is a huge population to cover and every single ASHA member is fully committed to being at the front lines to fight this COVID war. We hope that you will fight with us and together we can overcome this. Thank you.